Hello everybody and welcome to episode one of my video series in which we program a video game from scratch from beginning to end. So this is episode one. Before we get started with a lot of programming, uh, there's a lot of questions that we need to talk about, some introductions that we need to do. So first, uh, who am I? My name is Ryan Reese and I work for Microsoft. Of course, this is not endorsed or sponsored by Microsoft in any way. This is just my personal hobby. My uh, official title though at Microsoft is Escalation Engineer and I'm not a software engineer so I don't, uh, I'm not on the product group. Um, I work in support so I spend more of my time in the debugger debugging other people's code than I do writing my own. So just keep that in mind that I'm I have uh, my, my primary skill set is something other than programming and I do programming for uh, myself as a hobby it's just something that I've been interested in since I was a kid secondly what are we doing is the next question and well we're programming a video game from scratch and something that we are not going to do is we're not going to be using um, engines like Unreal Engine or Unity or things like this that are sort of frameworks that make game making really simple and those have a use uh, I, you know don't get me wrong uh, it's just we're not going to be using them we're going to be doing everything the long way the hard way from scratch what sort of video game are we making you're probably wondering uh, we're not going to be making a triple A we're not going to be making Assassin's Creed or Call of Duty, nothing like that. So I'm in my late 30s, and the Atari 2600 and the 8-bit NES and the 16-bit Super Nintendo, those were the sorts of consoles that I grew up with. Those are the sorts of games that have the most nostalgia for me. It's what I remember the most. So that's the sort of video game uh, that we're going to be making. And in fact, why don't I just show you? right over here so for example uh, this is this is Dragon Warrior for the NES and this is for you know 8-bit Nintendo came out probably 1986 or something like this and as you can see you know these are the sort of graphics I'm going for. This is an RPG, it's a role-playing game. And as you can see, hold on, let me get something where he's not in the dark. There we go. Sort of an overworld map setup going here. And as you can see, yeah, he you know he's walking around and everything is laid out in, in tiles. The map is laid out in tiles. He can only move. Uh, he moves a set distance every single time you move. And then you encounter these monsters in the wild and you fight them. And you have stats like HP and magic and experience points and all this kind of stuff. Then compare that with, um, let's see, uh, something that everyone probably knows. This is uh, the original Legend of Zelda on the NES. And Something that makes this different, it, you have the same sort of, you know, obviously it's 2D, you go and you fight monsters, but this is more, it, it's more real time, you walk around, and you don't have a that system where you saw in the last game where every time you move, you move in a, you move one full tile. This has a more sort of freedom of movement where you can move every pixel is basically open to you uh, to stand on. So that's a possibility. Uh, there's one other one. There's one other one that I want to show. Uh, this is Final Fantasy VI for the Super Nintendo, and this one is, you know, it's a newer console, newer generation console, so it's a lot more advanced. However, we've gone back to that system that we ha that we saw in the original Dragon Warrior, where every step you take is a full tile. Um, Let's see, 
and then you you know you go around and you talk to NPCs and you read a bunch of dialogue and you progress the story and you fight monsters and you you know have a party maybe full of different uh, different heroes and you equip them with different weapons and stuff like this. Okay, that's enough of that. So that's the kind of game that I want to make. I haven't actually decided yet though if I want to do sort of a fantasy theme like the ones you just saw or if I want to do a more sci-fi themed. I think that could be really cool. It's also something that hasn't been done quite so much to death. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, we're still very early. I haven't really planned it all out yet, so you're here along, uh, here for the ride. So the next question is, uh, what is the format of these episodes going to be like? So this is episode one of what I intend to be many episodes, probably more than 100, probably more than 500 uh, episodes, because it's going to take a while to make this game. Each episode is going to be about an hour long, so... I don't want to kill anybody's attention span. I don't want to kill myself trying to make these six hour long videos of me just sitting here programming. So I'm going to try to distill the interesting bits down into one hour episodes. And then if you have any questions or comments after the episode's over, after you've watched it, you can um, you know ask your questions in the comments I'll either answer them right there in the comments or if they're really interesting then I will talk about them I will talk about your questions or comments in the next episode so the next question why am I doing this uh, why am I doing this well because uh, I've always wanted to make a video game and I also really love low-level programming and I feel like if I make these episodes then it serves two purposes. Number one, I want them to be educational. I, I would hope that the audience gets something out of this, learns something out of this. But secondly, it, I'm hoping that it will also help me actually finish this project. It gives me a reason to keep going. That's something that programmers have a lot of issues with is we keep starting projects but never finishing them. So I'm hoping that this video series will help me actually finish uh, this project. And I hope that I learn some things along the way. And I hope that the community will sort of continue to encourage me to finish this and push me. So I guess that is the intro out of the way. So next we need to start talking about actually programming because that's what this video series is, is all about we are going to be using the C programming language and that in today's age you know in the year 2020 it seems kind of an odd choice although not so much maybe not so much uh, let me let me start by saying when I was younger when I was going to school I started programming just you know self-taught as a hobby when I was about 13 14 and I started trying to, you know, sign up for uh, classes, like programming classes, and, and started trying to consume a material that would make me a better programmer. Problem is, is back in those days, this would have been the late, mid to late 90s, uh, back in those days, object-oriented programming was the only game in town. C++ and Java, those were like the only, only thing going. No one was going to teach you C anymore. Uh, C is actually the predecessor to C++. Uh, C is commonly referred to as a subset of C++. So C and C++ are two separate languages. C is the older ancestor. It originated somewhere around 1972. And it's one of the oldest programming languages around that is still in common use today. In fact, it's still in very common use today. At my job, for example, I debug Microsoft Windows, and Microsoft Windows is still primarily the operating system is written in C, just pure C, no C++. Now, of course, there are bits and pieces of it that are in C++, but 
um, you know, like those are like the uh, the auxiliary bits of it. Like what I mean, the core of the kernel is written in C. Uh, same with same goes with Linux. The core of that operating system is also written in C. So anyway, back to my story. Uh, C++ was like the only thing. C++ and Java were the two operating systems that anyone was willing to teach us at that time because at that time it was it was very much in fashion object oriented programming was and it was it, it was the wave of the future and uh, object oriented programming and C++ and Java those are just like all that we're going to need going forward and they sort of tried we tried to leave C behind for various reasons but it, it we did it uh, the fact of the matter is is that the world still runs on C because it's rock solid and reliable and you can do anything you can imagine with it so we're gonna use it it's my favorite language to this day so let's see what else did I want to talk about oh yeah so I you know uh, so I guess I still want to talk a little bit more about um, object-oriented programming and why you might want to use it why you might want to use it, might not want to use it um, so it I would say that my education in in programming actually hit a hurdle uh, like I, I was actually very slow to learn uh, to become a programmer because I didn't like I didn't like object-oriented programming. It just wasn't how my brain was wired, I guess, to, I didn't like it. And so I, I came away sort of disillusioned, thinking that I didn't actually like programming. It wasn't until much later, when I got back into old-fashioned uh, C, and it works, the way that it works is so much different, and I, I loved it so much more, and it, it really got me back into programming. When I was in college I took a class on another programming language C sharp which C sharp is object oriented programming taken to the extreme it's it's almost like programming with training wheels on because it's so easy everything snaps together all the classes interact with each other in these very elegant ways and it is a very elegant elegant language and C sharp definitely has its uses one thing that I really don't like about it though is that it's slow and let me tell you for the last more than 20 years people have been trying to tell me you know college professors and other programmers have been trying to tell me for 20 years that lang languages like C sharp and Java that are garbage collected and they run within a VM they're trying to tell me that those languages are just as fast as native code and it's just not true never has been and never will be and it's because of that performance is one of the main things that that keeps me cemented with C it's just like you can't beat the performance of C Maybe Rust may be getting close. Uh, Rust is a new language, but I don't know Rust, so uh, we'll have to save that for some other time. Maybe we can learn Rust together. But let's see. I guess we should start programming, shouldn't we? So let's see. Okay, so the first thing that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to download. Um, we're going to use Visual Studio, and I'm going to go ahead and just open it here. Now you're looking at you're you're looking at just a uh, you know basic install of Windows 10 and there's nothing really installed on it and all I've done I mean I installed a couple of games to play installed Steam but nothing else really installed on it so far um, I just installed Visual Studio so you can actually find this yourself if you go here. Visual Studio Community Edition, I think it's called. Yeah, Visual Studio Community Edition. I think we're on 2019. There's a lot of different 
um, like professional editions of Visual Studio that cost thousands of dollars, but uh, we don't need that for what we're doing. We can just use the community edition, which is free. So do you have to use Visual Studio? No, you don't. You can use all sorts of different compilers. You can use, you know, LLVM. Um, you can use GCC if you're on, on Linux. You, you can use any sort of tool chain you want, but since we're on Windows and Visual Studio is made for Windows and everyone, in, everyone including me is familiar uh, with the whole Windows ecosystem, uh, Visual Studio is still just a natural fit. You know, it's it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Uh, so here we are. We're in Visual Studio, and we're going to create a new project. Now, whenever I create a new project, notice there's all sorts of templates over here: empty project, console app, Windows Desktop Wizard. I should I should go ahead and mention that in Windows there are different types of, of programs you can make. For example, you can make a console application that only runs from within a command line like this. And um, there are Windows applications like Win32 applications like this and these you know applications have like a graphical user interface and they enter you can use the mouse to interact with them and things like this. Technically speaking, in today's age, you know, in Windows 10, there's more than that. There's like universal Windows apps and all this kind of stuff, and I definitely don't want to mess with any of that stuff. Uh, so for now, let's just think about console apps and GUI apps. That's what all these different templates are for, different types of apps that you can make. But I always just start with an empty project. That way you can just kind of start from there and nothing else will go into it that you don't already want for example if I created a uh, if I were to create like a Win32 GUI app from this template it would put a whole bunch of, of boilerplate code in there that isn't necessarily what I want so I would rather just start with uh, an empty project something else here that is empty is interesting to note is notice how it mentions uh, C++ and over here it mentions C++ and there's nothing in here about C. And remember earlier I told you we were going to be using C and not C++. Uh, the reason for that is because Visual Studio is not very friendly to C. Remember how I was telling you about how programming, the programming industry felt like object-oriented programming and C++ was the the wave of the future and it's all that anyone would ever need and we'd never need to use C ever again. Uh, that's sort of where Visual Studio is coming from. Like They don't have the best support for the C programming language. In fact, I think Visual Studio is still in the year 2020, I think that Visual Studio is still only compliant um, up to like the C89 standard, which is the standard of the C programming language that was standardized in 1989 and that's still what we're going to be using uh, today there have been more recent versions of the C programming language uh, probably most notably C99 which is 1999 uh, which is uh, um, you know it brings a lot of new features to the C programming language we don't get to use those uh, because Visual Studio doesn't support them they are a C++ first compiler and Visual Studio historically only supports the minimum amount of C necessary to also to also support all of the C++ bells and whistles so you know it's it's almost like we are swimming upstream here we're we're against the current because we're trying to program in C when the whole world really just wishes that we would use C++ instead, but we don't want to. I'm going to go ahead and hit next and create this empty project. And what am I going to call it? I'm going to call it Game B. And the reason why is because I don't know what this game is going to be called yet. And I'm not going to call it Game A because I already have a Game A. 
So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this game B. And you can save it wherever you want. And then I'm just going to place the solution in the project in the same directory and hit create. See, it's creating my project for C++ and for the Windows console. And so here's Visual Studio. There's nothing in this project yet. By the way, if my text is small, try to remind me to increase the size of this text because the resolution of this monitor that you're looking at is 1440, so it's 2560 by 1440. So if you're on a 1080p monitor, um, it might look, the, the text might look a bit small to you. However, I was afraid of, you, you know, downscaling my resolution because I was afraid of it, it might make the text blurry. So we'll see how it turns out. So if I look over here on the right side, here's my solution. And if I right click on source files, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new file. I'm going to add a new item. Now, here again, notice you, there's no, I can add C++ files, but you won't find any options in here for adding uh, C files. At least I don't think so. Uh, so what you can do though, is you can actually rename this file name, the file extension from CPP. If you name it .c, then the compiler, the Visual Studio compiler, will actually treat it as just a C file, not a C++ file. So that's what we're going to do, is we're going to rename the, the file extension to .c. That means that we won't be able to use any C++ in this file, only C. Also, I don't know if I want to name it source.c. I don't know. I may rename it later. I'll call it main.c for now. Then hit add. And there you have it. Here we have our first file. And if we were to look at this in the file system, let's see, can I can I right click on this and then uh, no? Okay. Well, I was trying to, let's see. Stand by. Here it is uh, on the file system. So if you if you look in Windows Explorer, you can see it right here. It's uh, game B, and it's, they're just files on disk. And here's my source code file, and then the you know here's my solution file, and then you know these chunks of uh, these files are are you know for Visual Studio's use. They just describe your project. They're they're metadata basically. So back to the back to the source code file. Let's see. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start with a main function. So there, we just wrote our first function. So traditionally, in a C program, they pretty much always the entry point is this function called main. And you just call it main. Now technically. You can name it whatever you want as long as you tell the linker the name of the function. It doesn't necessarily have to be called main, but traditionally it's always called main. That's the starting point of your program. And when I wrote int here, that's short for integer, and what it means is that we have a function, and when this function runs, it's going to return an integer. So functions can return all sorts of things. They can return any sort of data type. They can return um, characters. They can return pointers. They can return all sorts of stuff. Um, but traditionally, main returns an integer. And the reason why this is a you might care what main main returns is like. Imagine if you were on a like a Unix or a Linux type operating system and you're using a, you know shell script and you want to run your command line program in a script and you want to know was my did my program run successfully well you might actually want to capture the return value from the main function you know say oh my program exited with an error code that means that something went wrong that I should investigate do you have to do that no you could just put void here and say that's symbolic for saying this function returns nothing we don't care about the return value 
works fine that way, but you know, a lot of, a lot, you know, traditionally it's best practice to go ahead and make it return an integer. So remember, if you are returning something from your function, it always the function always needs to return something. So you can write this as you can write it like that, with or without the parentheses, doesn't really matter. But I personally prefer the parentheses. Again, it's just more of an old school uh, way of, of writing it. And if you haven't figured it out by now, I am pretty old school, especially when it comes to C. So, so now we have a function. This is actually, let's see if we can compile this. If I go to build and then go to build solution, I wonder if it'll work. Yeah, see down here it says build succeeded. And if you want, you know, I can make this text bigger right here. There we go. That's huge. Okay, so build succeeded, zero error, zero warning. So this is a valid, we have created a valid C program. We just compiled it. And if I go back to the file system over here, we'll see that it has created an executable. There's my executable, game b.exe. So this is actually a good point for me to talk about these different profiles in Visual Studio. So these different profiles, you have a, well, you have these drop down menus right here. You have a debug, you have release, and over here you have x64 and x86. So these different profiles tell Visual Studio, they tell the compiler what sort of project you want to make. If you select x64, it's telling Visual Studio, hey, I want to compile this executable for a 64-bit operating system, a 64-bit computer. 64-bit operating systems are the norm these days. Um, Ten years ago, 32-bit operating systems used to be the norm. And even before that, we used to use 16-bit operating systems a long time ago. So typically, I'm going to leave this on 64-bit um, because that's the most common thing, the most common platform these days. Um, but you could go with x86 and x86 and 32-bit are basically synonymous. So just rem remember that. Uh, we have debug and release. Um, this is a bit more interesting because if I compile this project with uh, in debug mode, debug mode basically tells the compiler to turn off all of its optimizations. By turning off all of its optimizations it makes the executable a lot easier to debug and that's why they call it debug mode. My phone reacted strangely I think to me saying the word debug. Anyway, if I compile the same executable in release mode the compiler will turn on all of its optimizations. So the compiler will do things like not initialize all of the uninitialized memory. It will um, it will optimize out any sort of like variables um, that it needs to that it can, that it can optimize it out during while it's running. Uh, it will reorder CPU instructions as necessary. Every last thing that it can do, every last trick in the book, to try to make your executable run faster. So when you compile in release mode you get you get a smaller executable, you get a faster executable, it's leaner, uh, meaner, all of that. On the downside though it's much more difficult to debug because if you had to break into a release mode executable and try to try to debug it you would be all of those optimizations that I just talked about would actually make it look much more confusing to you as you're trying to debug the executable, make it much harder to debug. So just remember that if you're trying to actually debug something, make sure you're actually debugging the debug version of your executable, not the release, uh, not the release version. So I'm going to um, leave this in debug mode typically until you know it comes time to actually share this uh, executable with someone else until it comes time to actually quote unquote release it so alright so so back to the program we have our 
main function here, which while perfectly valid, also does absolutely nothing. Oh, and by the way, my neighbor over here is uh, grinding paint off of some 55 gallon drums with an angle grinder because he makes barbecue grills for a living and it's really annoying. While I, I support his, uh, his hobby and his alternate means of income, uh, it, it really is harshing my mellow right now, but we'll live. So we have this uh, main function over here that does nothing. So the next thing I'm going to do is what you'll probably see uh, over and over again is I'm going to enhance our main function with uh, some parameters. There we go. That should do it. Yeah. Okay, so what this means is now I have my main function. It's saying that my main function can now accept some input parameters. And these are very common. This is what you always see in a main function. And it's, they're basically, this is how you pass command line options into your program. So let's say, for example, you had, you know what, instead of doing that, let's just do it with our program. I wasn't going to show you just like a random program, but why don't I just show you our program? Uh, so let's do this. I am going to I'm going to explain all this. Okay, so this is saying I this is the number of arguments that have been passed into the program over the command line, and this uh, string right here is basically the 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 arguments, the the command line arguments in string form that have been passed over into us into the main function. Uh, so what I wrote here was printf, which is basically this is how we print things to the console. And if you notice that the text of printf is white and if I hover over it with my mouse it looks like Visual Studio does not recognize it. It doesn't know what the printf function is. And if I'm going to use it and like I'll compile it right now and it'll there'll be an error because the compiler doesn't know what printf is. It says printf undefined, unresolved symbol, etc etc. So what we're going to do now is we're going to add something called an include uh, include stdio.h. Okay, so the include directive basically tells the compiler, I want you to go find this file, std, stdio.h. I want you to go find that file, and I want you to basically stick it into this file. So, I mean, it's, it's literally a, a copy-paste operation. It's... We're, we're pasting the contents of this file right here into our own C file. So the STDD, stdio.h file, that's hard for me to say, stands for standard IO and it contains some function declarations for some very, very commonly used input output functions. One of which is the printf function. And if you'll notice, when I, as soon as I included that file, it the color of printf, it turned yellow. And that means, oh, now all of a sudden the compiler knows what printf means because we included this include file. So, so now, I, now I think he has an air horn out there just to mess with us. Ridiculous. So the printf, uh, uh, printf function Prints a, string, uh, prints a string to the console. And I'm going to print uh, the number of arguments that were passed in to this program, and then I'm going to exit. So I'm going to print the word arguments, and then this percent %i, this is called a token or a format specifier. It says, I don't want you to actually print a percent sign and an I, I actually want you to print the variable that I'm going to specify after after this comma, which the variable that I want 
to I want the compiler to actually print in this place is this variable right here argc which is it was passed into us uh, from the main function it's the number of command line arguments so let's see and then this is a new line character this is a this little forward slash here or backslash whatever you want to call it is a, an escape character it basically tells the printf function I don't want you to actually print slash n onto the screen I want you to print this which basically symbolizes a, a new line and then we're exiting with return zero so let's compile that and see what happens build succeeded now I'm going to I'm going to navigate over there where is it by the way Documents. No. Source. Repos. Game B. Okay. Source. Repos. Game B. Debug. No. Jack no, no. sixty four. In. No. Debug. CD. Finally, there's our program, gamev.exe. So if I hit enter, what it's going to do is it's going to print. It's going to print that line, arguments, and then one. And it printed one because it counts the name of the executable itself as one of the arguments. So printed one. And then it exited. The program exited. Now if I were to type some other stuff in here, like foo, and run it again, now it's saying I have two command line arguments because the name of the executable is one and then this first command line argument actually makes it equal to if I run the same thing again with another command line argument they're space delimited now I have three arguments now the arguments themselves are stored in this array right over here uh, argv which is it's an array of strings So let's do something here. This is called an if statement, uh, and we're telling we're telling the compiler if the number of arguments is greater than one, then I want you to do whatever I say inside this if block right here, which is going to be print f first argument is going to be that. Put my little semicolon there. And then what am I going to put in here? I'm going to put argv1. So this means because this is an array, and this is the array index right here. Arrays, they start at zero. So if I were to write argv0 in these brackets, that would be the first element of the array, which is the name of the executable, right? So the first actual command line argument would be the, the second element of the array, which is actually argv1, which should be whatever I type into the command line, whatever my first command line parameter is. So let me rebuild, let me go back. There. So it says I have two arguments, which there's my two arguments, and it says that my first argument is foo, which is what I wrote here. So everything is working as intended. The reason why I wrote only I only want to print that line if you actually specified, see if I don't specify any if I don't specify a command line parameter there, then it won't print that second that second piece. And the reason why that's important is because there's no there's no checking on like if I if I didn't have this I'm gonna comment that out and so I'm just going to unconditionally print that uh, where it says first argument but what if I didn't supply an argument what if the user didn't supply an argument I can tell you right now it's gonna crash it's gonna crash because I'm telling printf to, I want you to print the value of the argv1 
right there, but there is no argv1 if I don't supply a command line parameter. So it actually gave me a null. I think it was supposed to crash, but it was it was nice enough to give me a null there. Let's see what happens if I do that. There we go. Now I got a crash. Let me go look in here. Yeah, so I went and looked in my Windows Event Viewer, and I can see that I did just have an application, some application on this system just crashed. Application error 1000. And who just crashed? GameB.exe just crashed. And why did it crash? It crashed somewhere in this Universal C runtime. Yeah, it means I did something wrong with it. Basically, it's because I referenced. I referenced something that that doesn't exist. I referenced an element in that array that doesn't exist because I never supplied any command line arguments. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. I tried to say it in several different ways, tried to clarify it. So that's why I'm saying I only want to print this if the user actually supplied some command line arguments. Okay, so what else do we want to do? Oh, okay. I never actually, I never actually uh, said anything about variables, did I? Just cleaning up here. So in our function, uh, let's make another function. That's what we'll do. That's what we'll do. Let's make another function called mm, add to numbers. And this function is going to take as an input. As you can rem you remember from before, it means we're going to return an integer. In fact, I should I should actually clarify that this function only works with integers. You can name it whatever you want, but you should name it something descriptive so that people who are coming back and reading your code know what you were talking about. This is going to this function is going to take as an input. It's going to take two inputs, x and y, an integer x and an integer y. There we go. Sometimes Visual Studio like likes to generate errors for no reason, and then they go away randomly. It's one of the things I don't like about this IDE. It annoys me sometimes. Um, uh, let's see, where were we? Okay, so I'm going to return x plus y. Simple. So. All I'm doing is I'm basically I have a function that takes two numbers, adds them together, and then returns the result to the caller. So if I comment all this out, let's just forget about that stuff right now. And then I'm I'm going to declare a new integer here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna call it z. You can call it whatever you want, I'll just call it z. And I'm going to assign to that variable the output of that function that I just wrote, which is add two integers. And which two integers am I going to add? I'll say three and two. So we already know that the output will be, that, that the answer will be five, right? So if I just, I'll put the answer here. Say answer, and then the number, and then a new line, and then uh, That'll be z. Okay, so we're printing the value of z uh, to the console. So we'll compile that, we'll run it, and sure enough, it says answer is five. You know what? I can make this text bigger too, couldn't I? Make it a little easier for you to see. Yeah. Okay. All right. What else do I want to show? Ah, okay. So here is um, demonstrating a little bit of the debug, uh, debugging capabilities of, of the compiler, or of, of IDE, basically. Um, 
of the Visual Studio environment, if you will. So if I if I click right here and I go run to cursor, this program will actually run until it hits this mark right here where I have my mouse cursor. And if you look down here, we have all these variables in memory, which is really cool. So you, we're, we are debugging our program right now. It, say if it had a bug in it and we were trying to figure it out, this, this is what would help us find the bugs. So argc, which we already know is 1 because I didn't supply any command line parameters. Uh, we have um, argv, which is that array of string-based command line arguments. And since we didn't supply any, the only one in here is just uh, gameb.exe. And then we have our variable, which is z. We, we declared this variable, an integer z. And as you can see right now, it has basically, it has a nonsense value in it because it hasn't been initialized. So if I take one step, you can see the arrow right here is where I am in my debugging. If I take one step by hitting, I think it's F10, there. Now you can see that the value of Z has changed to 5. And you can see that the function add to integers has returned the value 5 and the value of 5 was assigned to the variable z and then I'm about to print it out to console right there so that's, that's debugging. So a lot of time <laughs> a lot of people make fun of people who debug using the, the printf statement like if you're trying to if you have a complicated program and you're trying to say you know I got to this area in my code, uh, you just write a little printf statement that says, here I am, and that's how you know that you got to that, that area in your code. That's a very inelegant way of, of debugging. And since I, by profession, am a debugger, I'm going to definitely put an emphasis on writing proper instrumentation and proper tools, uh, proper clues, uh, in our code that makes the debugger's life easier. It makes debugging easier. And I will say that I will say that you should do that. You should add debugging to your program as soon as possible, right from the beginning. Because if you don't start doing it right from the beginning, then you probably never will do it. And then your program will eternally be difficult to debug. Um, and if if you do go back and do it, it's going to be a lot harder than if you had just started doing it from the beginning. So that's probably a topic for an, another episode. One of these next episodes will we'll add something, um, add some proper debugging instrumentation in there. Um, let's see, where are we? Okay, so I think we have probably... I think we're probably at about an hour. I should have put a timer on. Uh, one other thing I, I did want to say though is if you go over here, all of this stuff is documented. Um, this is docs.microsoft.com and this article that I'm looking at right here, uh, you could probably earlier see that my eyes were darting off the screen. It's because I was looking at this stuff just to make sure uh, that I was typing it correctly. Uh, all this stuff is all, all this stuff is documented. Now, this actually this website used to be called MSDN, Microsoft Developer Network, and I bring it up because if you're writing a program that's going to run on the Windows operating system, then you're going to be referencing MSDN a lot. Uh, MSDN basically is the documentation for Windows. So if you're going to be interacting with the Windows operating system. You're going to be looking at this documentation a lot. And now it's not called MSDN anymore, though. They actually migrated it all to docs.microsoft.com. So if you hear me talking about MSDN, this is what I'm talking about. They just moved it. They don't call it MSDN anymore. Um, let's see. There is, oh, you know what? There is one other thing I want to talk about. There is definitely one other thing I want to talk about, and that is... 
that is, I'm going to erase this bit here so it's not in our way. So here's our little C program. I want to make a quick note about the difference between uh, ANSI and Unicode. So right now, this program is in what is what we what we would call ANSI, A-N-S-I, or um, ASCII, if you prefer. Basically means, if I were to look this up. Now, it's, it's basically a character encoding, ASCII tape. It's a way of representing characters using numbers because everything that a CPU does is numbers under the hood, right? So everything is has to be translated back and forth between, you know, ones and zeros, and those get translated into into hexadecimal, and then that gets translated into characters that you and I can read off of the screen. So, for example, this right here is how we for a long time represented every printable character on the keyboard using codes like numerical codes and as you can see this only goes up to 255 because each character was only 8 bits and if you have 8 bits you can only count up to a maximum of 255 we might we might do a, a binary lesson later but uh, maybe we'll do that next time. But I think we're running low on time, so I'm going to skip over that. You only had 8 bits with which to represent all these characters, which means you could only represent a maximum of 255 characters, which you see on your screen right now. We have your standard punctuation marks. We have your numbers. We have, you know, colon, semicolon, equal sign, question mark. We have capital, A through Z. We have lowercase, A through Z. And then we're pretty much done. Like we can't have any more characters other than that. So then computers uh, evolved to a point where we were like, you know what, we have a lot of characters besides just these 255 that we would like to represent. We have lots of different languages, you know, French and German. They have weird characters, little uh, sharp S and, you know, the characters that have tildes and accent marks over them. All those different types of characters, you know, we don't just have English uh, in this world. So we needed a new system that could display all these characters and more. And we called that Unicode. And the way we do that, essentially, is by allowing us to represent characters using more than 8 bits. We might use 16 bits instead of 8. And we might call that um, UTF-16. Uh, that's one type of Unicode. So with that little computer science lesson, hopefully that was clear as mud. So with that lesson, uh, I wanted to say that Windows, the Windows operating system, is natively a Unicode operating system. And what I mean by that is if we're interacting with the Windows operating system, we're going to be using what is called uh, Windows APIs. These are uh, application programmer interfaces, something like that, programming interfaces. A that's what API stands for. Um, actually, I don't need to show you that. I can show you that right here. What I mean by that is this. Let's take a Windows API function, like output debug text, which I cannot use yet because Remember with uh, remember the situation with printf before I had to include something before I could use that function because right now we don't know what output we don't know about the output debug text function so I'm going to include something called Windows.h and again if you are programming for Windows on Windows uh, this header file Windows.h is something that you're going to be using all the time and by the way you can actually also create your own header files that's what the dot h extension is for um, but right now we're just using ones that already come with they came with visual studio they come with any you know sdk um, the debugger they come with all sorts of different there's all sorts of different ways to get these header files uh, these right here came with visual studio uh, anyway so the output debug the output debug text function 
Does it not come with Windows? Apparently not. So I'm going to look it up. Output debug text. Sending text to debug output window. And that's not what I want. output debug string. Damn. Output debug string. And I'm just going to write the word. I'm going to write the string hi. Hello. Now when I do that I'm going to right click here and I'm going to write. I'm going to click run to cursor And then I'm going to go back over here down to where's my output? Window. Window. Finally. Okay, so I had to enable that output window. And this is an interesting output here. When I, okay, so the, the purpose of the output debug string function is that it's supposed to help the debugger, it's supposed to help you, comma, the debugger, debug your own program by outputting text based output to this window right here to a debugger which we're in one right now. Problem is, is, as you can see, it's all sort of mangled. And this actually plays in perfectly with the ANSI ASCII slash Unicode uh, lesson that I'm going for here. It's mangled because this function uh, thinks that it's getting Unicode input when I actually just gave it ASCII input. Now, let me go ahead and stop the execution right there. Let me go ahead and correct it by putting this little L character means that I'm writing a Unicode string instead of an ASCII string. Now let's run it again and see what happens. This time, as you can see, and let me increase the text size, can I? No, it won't let me. But as you can see down here in the corner, it properly printed the word hello into my debugger which is exactly what I was trying to do. So now let me stop again. Let me go back here. Now notice how the output debug string function is purple. And that's because if you hover over it, notice how the output debug string function has been defined to mean something else. And this is one of the core tenets of programming in Windows. This is something that you will see over and over and over again in Windows is because the, the compiler right now is assuming that I'm compiling either for Unicode or ASCII, it translates all of the Windows API functions into one or the other. So let me try to say that again. All of the Windows API functions have two entry points. They have a ASCII version, 
which as you can see right there, I just put the letter A on the end of it. It means that this is the ASCII entry point. And then they also have a uh, wide or Unicode version, which is right there. So now these functions do the same thing. This is the ASCII version, so I'm going to take that L specifier away. I'm going to write hello ASCII, and then on this line, notice this is the wide, wide me, wide or Unicode, same thing, because they call it wide because we use 16 bits to represent every character instead of eight. But I have to remember to put my L right there to tell the compiler that this is a Unicode string. There. Now, if I, and you know what, just to get this clutter out of the way, I'm going to get this clutter out of the way. Delete all that nonsense. Now, let me run to right here. What should happen is I get two properly formatted strings. One is ASCII and one is Unicode. The reason why I put all that is because, let's go ahead and stop execution. As I was saying earlier, Windows is natively a Unicode operating system. So if you are interacting with the Windows operating system a lot, you want to prefer using the Unicode version of the APIs. So you should always try to use the Unicode version of the APIs. So if I just write output debug string, notice how it's been defined, it's already, it, it, it defaults to the Unicode version. And if I hover over that, you can see that pound defined output debug string is actually output debug string W. So what's pound define? If I do pound define, if I say magic number, if I, I can, you know, 22. And that could be anything I want it to be. And if I do, let's do, let's do a def. It's like a variable. That's my pound define. I could have made it a variable, or I could have made it a pound define. So that's what a that's what a define is. And if I run that, let's see what happens. I crashed. Oh wait, no, I didn't. There it is. Magic number twenty-two. So it did what I thought it would do. Okay. So that's what it, that's what that is. I'll get that out of the way. If I go over here to the properties of my project and I go down to advanced, here, character set, use Unicode character set. I can actually change that to tell the compiler to use a multi byte character set, which is just another name for ASCII or ANSI, the one we were talking about. It's the smaller character set. I hit OK. Oh, and I want to make sure this applies to all configurations in all platforms. That's these little profiles right up here. Okay, so when I do that, look what happens. Now, output debug string is now defined as output debug string A. Does that make sense? So, what happens whenever, what happens when I use this output debug string A this function is actually going to send my ASCII input to Windows. Windows has to translate it to Unicode, process it, get the result, translate it back into ASCII, and then back to my program. All those translations are uh, costly. They're, they, they cost you in terms of performance. Now most of the time you won't notice on a fast computer, but it's worth noting that you 
because you want to avoid these unnecessary translations between you and Windows, you should strive to use the Unicode version of Windows API whenever possible. And that is that. So with that, I'm sure that we've gone over time. I wanted to get some C programming basics uh, into episode one as an introduction. So starting with um, episode two, I think we'll just pick up where we left off here. We are going to eventually turn this, if you can believe it, what we have right here, we're going to eventually turn that into a video game with graphics and sound and all of that kind of stuff. So should be pretty cool. Uh, stay tuned, and I will see you next time. Bye.